Sri Vishnu Sahasranama. Name 873 is Satya. This name has already come twice in Vishnu Sahasranam. We can understand it's a very important name. Previous names just prior to this are Satvavan and Satvik, which point to a similar meaning. They both have Sat in them. Satya is a well-known word and a well-known name. It means truth. That is the general translation of satya. Truth in English is also a very well-known word. Um, probably in most languages it is. It would be interesting as a philosophical come linguistic exercise to examine the nuanced meanings of the word truth in various languages, especially languages that come from very different cultures. For instance, the word truth in English and French, the import of that might not be so different, but the import, for instance, in Chinese or Japanese might be quite different, or in Swahili. Anyway, truth is a well-known word in English. As satya is a well-known word in Sanskrit and Hindi and other languages. <clears throat> what do we mean by truth? It's a major philosophical question which is at the heart of all philosophy. In the various divisions of philosophy, the essential division on which all others stand is ontology, the nature of being. So this is the basic question in ontology. What do we mean by truth? Where will we go for the answer? We have to go to a guru. Or more, or more conventionally, to the dictionary. In one English dictionary, which I consulted, I found four main meanings. The first is in three divisions because there it's nuanced. And actually, although we have four meanings, they're all interrelated. It's not as different as, uh, for instance, when we say the word Earth, which can mean the planet Earth. It can mean the material, which covers much of the surface of the Earth. And it can also refer, by derivation, it can refer to the earthing in an electric socket. So you say the earth when you mean the particular, you say the earth, it, it's derived from the connection with the earth, which helps to prevent electric shocks. So one word can have various meanings and very different meanings. Another example is plain. Plain can mean that which a man-made vehicle for flying in the sky, or it can mean level, higher and lower planes or levels. 
Uh, it can mean a tool that is used in carpentry or the act of using that tool. It's, it's used in geometry, so it has various unrelated meanings. But the, the meanings given for truth, they're all quite similar. Okay, here we go. 1A, conformity to fact or actuality. In the example given, does this story have any truth? Is it true? Is it, someone came and told me such and such happened, is it true? Reality, actuality. In truth, he was not qualified for the job. So here it means, act. you could say, actually, he was not qualified for the job. So in truth, here is a synonym, phrasal synonym of actuality. The reality of a situation. The truth is, she respects your work. So again, that could be uh, like actually. Then 2a, a statement proven to be or accepted as true. Truths about nature. Such statements considered as a, considered a, uh, considered as a group. Researchers in pursuit of truth. What is the truth about the JFK assassination? Oh dear, let's not talk about that. Anyway, you get the idea. Sincerity or integrity, the truth of his intentions. In other words, inside and outside the same. Truthful means not only telling the truth, but not deceiving others by pretending to do or say one thing while your intentions are different. Then fidelity to an original or standard, the truth of the copy. We could more like say this is a true copy. I certify that this is a true copy of this and that document. That's in legalese. <clears throat> the number five, this is the one we're looking for. This is in theology and philosophy. That which is considered to be the ultimate ground of reality. The fact, here again we get into ontology, philosophy, which segues into theology. The fact that anything exists is because he exists or the absolute truth exists. The absolute truth is Vishnu. There is reality because he is real. So to understand what is real, that is the whole quest of Vedanta. And this is what we're looking at when we say that Vishnu is Satya, we're talking about the absolute truth. In this regard, I'm going to read from the first words of Srila Prabhupada's introduction to his Srimad Bhagavatam commentarial opus. Srila Prabhupada, the first two sentences, or first one and a half sentences, the conception of God and the conception of the absolute truth are not on the same level. The Srimad Bhagavatam hits on the target of the absolute truth. Oh, yes, that's a heavy philosophical start. You can understand this is not just some storybook. As some people say, the Puranas are just storybooks. This is heavy or profound philosophy. The conception of God and the conception of the absolute truth are not on the same level. I, they're not the same. People tend to think of God in a 
effective way and of the absolute truth in a philosophical way. So what are we looking at in the Srimad Bhagavatam? Actually, it's both, but Srila Prabhupada states here the Srimad Bhagavatam hits on the target of the absolute truth because the Bhagavatam starts with that. Janmadhyasa se yataha. Which is a description of the Brahma. The, the, this is the opening of Vedanta Sutras. The Brahma, that, that which is to be inquired into. The absolute truth is Janmadhyasa se yataha. The first words of Srimad Bhagavatam. That from which... Everything emanates, that which in everything rests, that in which everything ultimately enters is the absolute truth. Of course, the Bhagavatam goes on in the opening three verses to introduce the concept of God who is Vedyam Vastavam, Atravastu. This is the actual subject of the Vedas, and this is God who is rasamai, full of rasa, and is to be enjoyed by the rasic bhaktas. So we can say the Srimad Bhagavatam, it hits on the target of the absolute truth, but it's not dry philosophy. Absolute truth means a killer Rasamrita Murti, the very form of all nectarian rasas, emotional experiences. Now I'm going to read from a book by Aldous Huxley called The Perennial Philosophy. This book is still in print after over, it's been in print for over half a century. He studied, it's been a very influential book, he studied mysticism throughout the world and came to the conclusion and gave many examples of this, of how Throughout the world, there is a level of realization of the truth. This is truth with a capital T uh, among en spiritually enlightened people. So this corresponds with the absolute truth realized as Brahman realization. He analyzes, in the paragraph that I'm going to read, the usage of the word truth. By the way, I'm not saying that Aldous Huxley's book, The Perennial Philosophy, is the last word in the absolute truth. The last word in the absolute truth is Srimad Bhagavatam. But it is relevant to discussion of the word truth, what I'm going to read here. <clears throat> he wrote, in religious literature, the word truth is used indiscriminately in at least three distinct and very different senses. He's a, an analyst, indiscriminately. In other words, you use the word in religious literature, but it's used with different nuances, and often even the persons who are using the word in various contexts are not very scrupulous in using it. They're not very aware of how they are using it in different senses. So Aldous Huxley continues, Thus it is sometimes treated as a synonym for fact, when it is of, as when it is affirmed that God is truth, capital T, meaning that he is the primordial reality. So it... it in other words, what he's saying is mirroring the various nuanced understandings of the word truth or usages or meanings of the word truth from the dictionary, 
but mapping it onto religious or philosophical or spiritual or metaphysical usage. So continuing with Aldous Huxley. But this is clearly not the meaning of the word in such a phrase as worshipping God in spirit and truth. Here it is obvious truth signifies direct apprehension of spiritual fact as opposed to second-hand knowledge about reality formulated in sentences and accepted on authority or because an argument from previously granted postulates was logically convincing. So here, Mr. Huxley, or Aldous Huxley, distinguish him from his also distinguished brother, Thomas Huxley, in other words, what he's saying, worshipping God in spirit and in truth means with realization. You're actually worshipping God, actually experiencing God, rather than doing so as a belief because someone told you or someone managed to convince you logically, but talking about experience of God. Worshipping God in truth means direct experience. All this Huxley continues. And finally, there is the more ordinary meaning of the word, as in such a sentence as, this statement is the truth, where we mean to assert that the verbal symbols of which the statement is composed correspond to the facts to which it refers. Here we're getting into the philosophy of language, a little peek into the philosophy of language. In Vedic literature also, satya has different nuanced meanings. Satya vakya, to speak what is true. Aho satyam etaduktam. Ah, that means yes. What, is, what has been stated is certainly the truth. Or you may say satyam, satyam, to mean yes, sure. To affirm what someone has said. Satyam as reality, in this case, if you're affirming. And, and satyam can refer to ordinary reality, and ultimate reality. So this truth, satyam, is a central concept in Vedanta. It, it means that which remains the same in the past, in the present, and the future. It doesn't change. When we say that the philosophy of Shankara, Brahma Satyam Jagan Mitya, he says, Brahma is real, the, the universe is not real. That is challenged by the Vaishnava Acharyas who say this world is real. But in one sense, we also accept it as unreal because it doesn't have any permanent reality. But the ultimate truth is whom, in whom there's no change. This is a major point of understanding Brahma. Uh, the difference between the Shankara's philosophy and that of the Vaishnava philosophers to explain how in he who there is no change and how is the material world manifested in which there is change, so much change. Actually, I've discussed all this in the previous discussions of the word satya and in other Vishnu Sahasranam talks. And naturally, as this name Satya has come up three times, there will be overlapping in what I'm talking about. But it's very important topics and no harm if we overlap. So what we have as Satya is the absolute truth is ever the same. His nature remains the same in all three periods of time. In this regard, I'm going to read from Krishna book, chapter 2, Srila Prabhupada's Unpacking of the verse in the 10th canto, chapter 2, when the demigods are praying to Krishna and calling him Satya. In so many different ways, he's Satya. Now, in 
previous discussions of this name, I, I analyzed this verse in great detail. But instead, I'm going to read three paragraphs from Krishna book in which Srila Prabhupada unpacks this. And it's profound. We're talking about Krishna as Satya. And practically every line, every word could be unpacked further and further. It's pregnant with meaning. It's so profound. One great gift of Srila Prabhupada, he, he put such exalted topics, uh, such in uh, and, and such abstruse, esoteric topics in such easy language that even people with no background in this can begin to enter into its understanding. Anyway, I'll read. Then the demigods addressed the Lord as Satyam Param, or the Supreme Absolute Truth. Everyone is searching after the truth. Oh, that's a, that's a big statement in itself, isn't it? How we could unpack that. Everyone is searching after the truth. That is the philosophical way of life. The demigods give information that the supreme absolute truth is Krishna. One who becomes fully Krishna conscious can attain the absolute truth. Krishna is the absolute truth because unlike relative truth, he is truth in all the three phases of eternal time. Time is divided into past, present and future. Krishna is truth always, past, present and future. In the material world, everything is being controlled by supreme time in the course of past, present and future. But before the creation, Krishna was existing. And when there is creation, everything is resting in Krishna. And when this creation is finished, Krishna will remain. Therefore, he is the absolute truth in all circumstances. If there is any truth within this material world, if there is any truth within this material world, it emanates from the Supreme Truth, Krishna. If there is any opulence within this material world, the cause of the opulence is Krishna. If there is any reputation within this material world, the cause of the reputation is Krishna. If there is any strength within this material world, the cause of such strength is Krishna, if there is any wisdom and education within this material world, the cause of such wisdom and education is Krishna. So we think, well, we, truth, okay, but why are we, if we're discussing the truth, why are we discussing about Krishna being the cause of opulence, reputation, strength, wisdom, education? Srila Prabhupada wraps it all up at the end of this paragraph. Therefore, Krishna is the source of all relative truths. This material world is composed of the five principal elements, earth, water, fire, air, and ether. And all such elements are emanations from Krishna. The material scientists accept these five primary elements as the cause of the material manifestation, but the elements in their gross and subtle states are produced by Krishna. The living entities who are working within this material world are products of his marginal potency. In the seventh chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, it is clearly stated that the whole manifestation is a combination of two kinds of energies of Krishna, the superior energy and the inferior energy. The living entities are the superior energy and the dead material elements are his inferior energy. In its dormant stage, everything remains in Krishna. The demigods continue to offer their respectful prayers under the supreme form of the Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna, 
by analytical study of the material manifestation. What is this material manifestation? It is just like a tree. A tree stands on the ground. Similarly, the tree of the material manifestation is standing on the ground of material nature. This material manifestation is compared to a tree because a tree is ultimately cut off in due course of time. A tree is called vriksha. Vriksha means that thing which will be ultimately cut off. Therefore, this tree of the material manifestation cannot be accepted as the ultimate truth because it is influenced by time. But Krishna's body is eternal. He existed before the material manifestation. He is existing while the material manifestation is continuing. And when it will be dissolved, he will continue to exist. Therefore, only Krishna can be accepted as the absolute truth. So that is an, that, those three paragraphs is an elaboration on the point that that, we, that which remains the same in the past, present and future is the absolute truth. So this is an elaboration on how Krishna is the absolute truth and nothing else. Everything is subject to change. Therefore, it cannot be the ultimate reality. Satyadeva Vashishta, in expanding this, or commenting on this name Satya here, refers to the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 17, verses 26 and 27, in which Lord Krishna discusses the nature of that which is Sat from which we can understand that which has the quality of satya means that which is sat. And Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, sad bhave sadhu bhave cha sad ityay tat prayujyate prashaste karmani tata sad chabda partha ucchate Nyagye tapasi dane cha stiti sad iti chochate. Karma chayva tadar tiyam sad ityeva bhidhiyate. So Krishna in two verses explains in synopsis the meaning of the word sat. Srila Prabhupada's translation. The absolute truth is the objective of devotional sacrifice and it is indicated by the word sat. The performer of such sacrifice is called sat, as are all works of sacrifice, penance and charity, which, true to the absolute nature, are performed to please the Supreme Person, O son of Prita. So, yeah, to, again, to unpack this... It's a big job. To understand Krishna is not such an easy thing. To understand him as Satya, he's the actual reality, the actual fact, the actual truth. For us who have been floating in the atmosphere of illusion since time immemorial and who are as if programmed to think in the wrong way, this understanding of satya might seem very difficult. Ahankari mattohaya nitai padapasharya asatyare satya karimani. This is a position forgetting nityananda, uh, forgetting the absolute truth who is eternal and blissful. Uh, what happens? Then we take that which is unreal to be real. We take real to be unreal. And we're just as if mad, insane with egoism. So the word sat being discussed here in Gita refers to existence, goodness, 
good actions, devotion to sacrifice, austerities, and gifts, and any acts which further those purposes. One who is excellent in all of these, or one who supports those who act along these lines, is Satya. This is Satya Deva Vashishta's understanding. One who supports those who are sat, or one who himself is sat, can be called Satya. So we can say like that, he's, he's, a, he's a Satya. A satya Manush, he's a, he's a real, truthful, uh, sincere person, someone who can be trusted. Previously, when the name appeared first in verse 12, Prashabhata took Sat to mean the pious souls, good people, and gave the ex explanation that the name means Teshu Satsu Sadhu one who is well disposed toward the pious souls. He loves those who are truthful. Truthful means, ultimately means to be a devotee of Krishna. That's what it ultimately means. There's also worldly truthfulness. And in general, we can see that people who are truthful, they are trusted. The, the great example of that is Kangsa trusting Vasudeva when Vasudev made a bargain plea with Devaki, who was, about, who was about to be executed, not that she or he had done anything wrong, but Kangsa was a demon. Vasudev said, don't kill this woman. I promise to deliver all her sons to you. And Kangsa had, even though Kangsa was a demon, he trusted Vasudev because Vasudev was known to be truthful. Now we may say that Vasudev later hoodwinked Kangsa and pretty much everyone else by not delivering his eighth son to Kangsa. Well, this is on a higher level of truthfulness. But in general, if people are truthful, then they're trusted, their word is trusted which is why it, it seems it's so, so hard to trust anyone nowadays. Definitely be, be foolish to trust an unknown person. There are people who specialize in posing as being very trustworthy in order to cheat people. Trust Krishna. Satya can mean one who is good in the very best way, who is sat, but in the very best way. This is how Parashrabhata explains this in verse 25. Again, he uses the good, the pious souls for the term sat and says that one who is exceptionally good the devotee is good because Krishna is good. Krishna is always good, especially those who are his devotees. Why is he inclined to his devotees? Because they are good. They are full of good qualities. Uh, Prashrabhata gave the example at, verse tw at the instance of the name Satya in verse 25 that... Vishnu is sat, he's satya, because he does good to those who seek his help. He gave the example, among the innumerable examples, he gave the example of Manu, who sought his help, took refuge in him when the deluge was about to uh, flood the world. He's always true to his devotees. He'll never abandon them. We can trust him. Trustworthy. An extract from a translation of Divya, from the Divya Prabhandas, 
to those who are sincerely devoted to him without looking for any benefit, personal benefit, he is always true. In other words, for those who desire only service to him and don't worship him for some petty material so-called benefits, he, you, you can trust he will reciprocate. Others may worship him, again, with petty desires, and he gives them some benefit. But then he will leave them and there won't be any bond between him and them. Actually, this is not exactly what Krishna says in Gita. From If we see the Chatur Vidha Bhajante Maranjana Sukriti Norjuna, Somehow, if people approach Krishna, he'll reciprocate with them. Mm. Then another meaning. In, in the current instance of this name, the one that we're discussing now, Prashrabhata gives the meaning, he who is established in truth. He is truth. He is truth. If we, want to, we can say satya, it is true. We can say, yes, it is true, it is true as Narayan is true. He is delineated by the sattvic shastras, those shastras which are especially meant for persons on the path of self-realization. Uh, other shastras may mislead people to worship in the mode of ignorance or the mode of passion, but he's especially delineated by the sattvic shastras. And what is stated about him in there is true. When it's stated in some shastras that Agni is supreme or Shiva is supreme, it may be taken that the demigod with that name is supreme, but that is misleading. But when it says when the Shastra says that Vishnu is supreme, that is true, that is Satya, because he is fully established in truth. In this regard, Parashrabhata quotes from Mahabharata in a section when at the request of Dhritarashtra, Sanjay recites some of the names of Krishna, why he's called Vasudev, for instance, and then why is he called Satya? Sanjay explains, Satya Pratishtita Krishna Satyam Atra Pratishtitam Satya Satyam Chagovinda Tasmat Satya Satamataha Krishna is rooted in Satya and the truth, Satya, is rooted in Krishna. Existence and non-existence are both established on Govinda, therefore he is called Satya, truth. Shankara says that Satya means who is real and who alone exists. Now, we in the Gorya Vaishnava school can accept this within the scope of Achinta Bheda Bheda Tattva. Whereas Shankara, when he says, Ekam Satya, Eko Satyam Dvitiya Nasti, he quotes from Shastra, that the, the truth is one and there's no other, he takes it to mean. Absolute oneness. There's no vari variety is false. That's how Shankara takes the, the fact that the truth is one who is real and who alone exists. We accept that. Shankara accepts that without qualifying it in any way whatsoever. But we don't. See the difference between Shankara and 
Madva, Madva in his Mahabharat Tadparya Nenai says, Satya Vishnur Guna Sarve, Satya Jivesha Yormid, Satya Jivesha Yormidha, Satyo Mito Jiva Bheda, Satyang Cha. Jagadi Drisham Asatya Svagato Beda Vishnu Nanyad Asatya Kam Jagat Pravaha Satyo Yang Pancha Beda Samanvitaha Madhva says all the attributes of Lord Vishnu are real, they're true. The difference between God and the jivas is real. They're true. So in other words, he refutes Shankara's Kevala Advaita. There's only oneness. One, 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 one. And, and, but major point that Madhva points out. The differences are real. The mutual differences among the jivas are real. And... The world as we see it, as it exists, is real. And in respects, in respect of Vishnu, the internal differences, such as the difference between himself and his attributes among his incarnations, his avatars, his actions, and so on, they're not true in the sense that he is one reality. This is philosophy, the philosophy of the absolute truth. It's not the same as watching a baseball game, munching some crisps, sitting on a sofa, that's for sure. So, Krishna's attributes are not different from him. So, there's no difference between Krishna and his attributes. There appears to be difference. Krishna's eyes look different to his ears, but they are not different in the sense that they, Krishna and his body are non-different. Krishna and his qualities are not different. All else is true, Madhva says. It is true that cows are differentiated from goats. It is true that the legs of a cow are different from the tail of a cow. I'm just giving some examples. The flow of this world, as it goes on, it's real. And the differences within it are real. He very strongly opposes Shankara's unqualified monism. Shankara gives an, a few other interpretations. Uh, one of them is that he is in the form of prana, the life air, anna, food, and surya. Surya is generally understood to mean the sun. The name surya comes up soon in Vishnu Sahasranam. Of course, Shankara, when he gives his interpretations, some of them sound very devotional, but some of them seem to Re, to be attempting to reinforce his philosophy of unqualified monism, Kevala Advaita Vad. By the way, the Shankara, it's not exactly sure which Shankara wrote this, because there are many, even today, there are several sadhus and scholars by the name Shankara Acharya. Uh, it's widely believed that this commentary on Vishnu Sahasranam was penned by the original Shankaracharya, but there is some doubt about that in scholarly circles. But it, it, it seems to have definitely been penned, if not directly by him, by someone in his philosophical lineage, in other words, leaning towards Advaita Vada. So we, we as aspiring Vaishnavas should be somewhat careful when we discuss his glorification of Vishnu, uh, 
because in some cases it's mixed up with his uh, philosophy which we reject. Shankara says, he's called Satya because he's real, not false. Okay, very good. We accept that. Avitata Rupat Vat. Shankara refers to Taitariya Upanishad, the well-known statement, Satyam Jnana Manantam Brahma. Then, uh, again from Shruti, Satcha Syat Cha Abhavat. He is all that exists in the manifest and unmanifest conditions. He who is in the form of Pran, Ana and Surya, or he who is the origin or the Antaryami of Prana, Ana and Surya. This is from Taitariya Aranyaka. Sad iti pranasti tiyannam yamityas avaditya. Another reference from the Atharva Veda, Satyadeva Vashishta, a recent commentator, very deep in Shastra, gave us all kinds of quotes. Quoted from Atharva Veda, is, or that's. Uh, Atharvana Upanishad, maybe. It just says Atharva here. Satye no tabhita bhumi, surye no tabhita chadyao, retaina adityas tishtanti divisomo adhishrita. Truth, satya, this is the definition of satya from Shruti, is the base that bears the earth. By Surya are the heavens upheld, by law, Ritta, the Adityas stand, and Soma has his place in heaven. Then Ananta Krishna Shastri translates this Satya, he who is good towards the good. This is also... Um, Discussed, we've already discussed that by Parasha Bhatta. Uh, Satsu Sadhudvad, this is the way that Ananta Krishna Shastri says, he who is the, the virtue of the virtuous. In other words, if someone is truth speaking, that is that virtue is reflected in that person from Vishnu. He who is the embodiment of truth since he speaks the truth. He speaks the Bhagavad Gita. He speaks the Vedas. Or he whose words always come true. Satya vachan dharma rupat vat satyaha. So this can be understood as one who always speaks the truth or whose words always come truth, true. Uh, this is derived from Mahanarayana Upanishad, Tasmat Satyam Paramam Vadanti. Therefore, they say that truth is supreme. Satyasya Satyam, from Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, sat, sat, the, the, Satyasya Satyam means the truth of the truth the essence of the truth, the truth which makes the truth the truth. Satyasya satyam iti prana vai satyam tesham esha satyam. The pranas of the, are true and he is the truth of the pranas. Krishna willing, I'll continue speaking on this name in another session. Vancha kalpa tarubhyas chakripa sindhubhya Patita Anam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namo Namaha Dante Nidaya Chunakang Padayane Patikrit Vacha Kaku Shatam Etad Aham Bravimi He Sadava Sakala Eva Vihaya Durat Goranga Chandra Charane Kuruta Anara Parivada Tu Jano Yata Tata Va Nanu Mukaro Navayang Vichara Yamaha Hari Rasa Madira Madati Mata Bhuvi Vilo Tama Nartama Nirvishama Hari Krishna Hari Krishna 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 Hari Hari 
हरे रामा हरे रामा 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 हरे हरे